All right. Uh, welcome back again. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Rainer Engelken, the postdoc at Columbia University. And uh, we are very much looking forward to your talk. Um, and uh, let's just go for it since we are five minutes late. I think I... I miss you now. Uh, I think it just disappeared. <laughs> Sorry about that. Hi. No Hi. Can you can you hear me? Great. Um, now I'm trying to share again. Um, share. Great. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, but not in. Okay, perfect. Yes. All good. Go for it. Great. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and thanks for everyone for voting uh, my, for my abstract and giving me the chance of presenting my work here. I'm also very grateful for the organizers for putting together this uh, awesome online conference. And thank you all for choosing to tune in here this morning instead of doom scrolling through news about a dumpster fire that seems to be floating down the river again. Um, I want to tell you, uh, my name is Rainer Engelken, I'm postdoc at the Center for Theoretical Neuroscience, and I want to tell you today about how to use dynamical system theory to improve gradient descent, and specifically zero-get gradient descent in uh, recurrent and spiking neural networks. This is work that I've been uh, done together with my postdoc advisor, uh, Larry Abbott. And um, I should say the spiking part is really new and still um, in the making. So I think it's the perfect time to get feedback. So please ask many questions. I'm happy to cut my uh, talk uh, short to 12 minutes and instead get more ideas and a good discussion going. Um, so imagine you go to a really nice dinner, you ate lots of different food, and then a couple of hours later, you don't feel very well. Now it's uh, crucial to figure out what uh, of these many different foods made you not feel well. And it's actually so important for survival in the animal kingdom that neuroscience gave it an, its own name. It's called conditioned taste aversion. And it's one specific instance of the more general uh, temporal credit assignment problem, which relates to the problem of finding relationships between temporally distant cues and later rewards or outcomes. And um, when we think about temporal credit assignment in recurrent networks, usually we think of some um, input, then some uh, recurrent um, dynamics and some generated output. And to do this temporal credit assignment, a common way is to unfold this dynamics in time. So now we have basically a, a deep network where each time step corresponds to, uh, where each layer corresponds to one time step. And uh, we now want to find an association between this later outcome and this earlier input. And for that, we have to go through all these um, hidden layers step by step. And uh, that is yeah, backpropagation through time. And more mathematically speaking, now let's just uh, for a second take a generic recurrent network. That means we have to uh, unfold it in time and then basically yeah, evaluate this gradient of the total loss, which means we have to, if you write down the gradient of this out loss at the end, we have to go backward through many time steps to figure out how, for example, an earlier parameter affects this loss. And that corresponds to doing chain rule over and over again. And if you do chain rule through many time steps, you run into this product of Jacobians. Each Jacobian tells you how the network state at one time point affects the network state at the next time point, And you need that to figure out the gradient of the loss. But um, over many time steps, you get this product of Jacobians. And these product of Jacobians, they tend to either explode if, that, if you have a, a spectral radius um, speaking, uh, simply speaking, bigger than one, or they seem to vanish, uh, they, they tend to vanish. 
And that's one of the reasons why people these days don't use um, recurrent networks as much anymore in machine learning, but other things like uh, transformers. So this um, problem of exploding vanishing gradients is notorious, and there have been different ways of tackling that. And um, I want to now give you a dynamical systems perspective, because this product of Jacobian also shows up actually when you analyze the stability of a system in the forward path. More specifically, in dynamical systems, we distinguish two qualitatively very different types of systems. If an, a small perturbation of some initial state decays over time, we call a system stable, and the exponential rate of convergence of these nearby trajectories is called the uh, largest Lyapunov exponent. Conversely, in a chaotic system, a small perturbation of a recurrent network state is exponentially pulled apart over time. And uh, that um, corresponds to a positive uh, Lyapunov exponent. And, and in a dynamical system, there are as many Lyapunov exponents as independent perturbation direction. And they um, now measure this uh, growth of volume elements in the tangent space. So you have a trajectory, and then there are stable and unstable manifolds around this um, trajectory. And the Lyapunov exponents, um, they um, quantify this um, uh, stability along your trajectory. And uh, we set out to measure these Lyapunov exponents in rate networks before, in case you want to check that out. But now I want to tell you about the implications for learning. Well, uh, the Lyapunov exponents are defined as the logarithms of the singular value of this long-term Jacobian. And so that means there is a direct mathematical link between Lyapunov exponents and the learning signals or gradient signals. So if you have a positive first Lyapunov exponent in the forward direction, that implies you have an exploding um, gradient signal in the backward pass and a negative first Lyapunov exponent in the forward direction means in backpropagation through time that your gradients are vanishing. And uh, yeah, we, we pointed that out earlier, but now I want to tell you how we can make that useful. So the idea is you push Lyapunov exponents towards zero. This way you can avoid exploding or vanishing gradients. So the, the idea is if you have Lyapunov exponents close to zero, these tangent space directions are neither exploding nor shrinking. And that means you can now transport a, an error signal over more time steps. So how can you do that, push Lyapunov exponent to zero? Well, the answer to any question in machine learning these days is do gradient descent. So we can just do gradient descent using backpropagation through time in, on an extra a loss term or regularization term, which is the sum of the first k Lyapunov exponents. So if you um, can write down a gradient for that, but then you might think, well, why don't we run into exploding or vanishing gradients when calculating this gradient? And for that, we can use actually a trick. More specifically, in dynamical systems theory, there's a standard a procedure to calculate these Lyapunov exponents that avoid evaluating this long-term Jacobian or the singular values of that directly, and instead um, have an iterative, a much more stable procedure. Just in a nutshell, you take an orthonormal system Q, you evolve it in every step through the, with a Jacobian into a new system, and then after a couple of steps, you do a QR decomposition. So you decompose this um, changed system into an uh, uh, orthonormal matrix Q S plus one and an upper triangular matrix R S plus one. And the diagonal terms of this R matrix, they are now the stretching and shrinking rates along all the different directions. And the off diagonal terms we can ignore, they are related to share or shear, whatever. And so the Lyapunov exponents are this way then um, obtained from the average of the um, logarithms of the uh, diagonal terms of this uh, R matrix. And now the whole uh, question is, how can we calculate gradients of that? It boils down to calculating uh, gradients of this QR decomposition. And conveniently, there has recently been progress in a field called differentiable linear algebra. So there are actually analytical gradients of QR decomposition, and uh, we can just uh, use them. And this way, we can make the calculation of Lyapunov exponents differentiable and then push them to zero either before or during learning. So here is an example. Here you see the largest Lyapunov exponent as a function of learning epochs. Let's say the target is zero, and we can see that over um, 80 epochs, we can push them close to zero. That also works for other targets, and we can do that not only for one Lyapunov exponent, but also for several. So here you see now the entire Lyapunov spectrum, 
and here I pushed one to zero. That's now after learning. Here, 16 are at zero, and here, 32 are pushed to zero. So in a nutshell, we can manipulate or shape the Lyapunov spectrum as we want. And for making networks train better, of course, we want to push them close to zero if you want to avoid exploding or vanishing gradients. So here is an example of a um, memory task, or you can just call it a simple copy task. Uh, without flossing, um, the network fails in this case. With flossing before the training um, on the task, uh, you perform to some extent. And if you actually also floss during training, that means you always do flossing and then you train for a couple of uh, hundred epochs and then you do a step of flossing again, you can um, achieve a good test, test accuracy. More systematically, here you see the test accuracy on this delay uh, memory task for different complexities. And you can see that uh, without flossing, it fails if you make the task, if you make the delay too, too, too long. But with pre-flossing or flossing during training, we can now bridge longer time horizons. And um, just as a side note, gradient flossing also boosts the gradient dimensionality. So the um, um, condition number, which is given by the ratio of the first and the m um, singular value of this long-term Jacobian can be um, estimated from the e to the first minus the mth Lyapunov exponent times the time difference. So the um, and and yeah, what you can see in, in numerical simulations is the condition number explodes as we make the time horizon larger. That means this long-term Jacobian is closer and closer to being ill-conditioned or singular. And uh, this analytical estimate agree that's in, in dashed lines here agrees very well with the numerics. But now, if you do gradient flossing, we can push that drastically down. That means that we can either um, have the same condition number over a longer time horizon, or that we can have more gradient dimensions for the same uh, for the same time horizon. Um, okay, so now let's uh, switch gears to spiking networks. How can we apply this concept from the system theory for spiking neural networks? As you all know, in spiking networks, neurons are described by their membrane potential and interact with pulsed interactions, which are notoriously difficult to um, um, train because they don't intrinsically have like a smooth gradient. And I will specifically talk about a forward Euler discretization of an decaying organ fire neuron with exponentially decaying synapses uh, that is recurrently connected. So basically a single layer recurrent um, uh, neural network. And yeah, the, the problem is um, that these gradients, if you just look at the exact gradients, they are very rugged. So either there is no gradient signal or suddenly the, the, the loss falls down. And now by using a more smooth spike function, we uh, you can get information also close to the spike times and not only at the at the spike threshold itself. So more specifically, if in a forward Euler discretization, this is the heavy side spike function. Basically, here is the uh, voltage threshold. Uh, if you smooth that out in the backward pass, uh, you can now also get gradient or um, uh, error signals for neurons whose membrane potential is slightly below the threshold or above the threshold. So you can create uh, new spikes or destroy spikes that you don't want. And um, taking the derivative of that, this is now the, the um, function that is being used in the backward uh, direction. If you calculate the, the backprop um, um, chain rule, um, you, you have here an um, yeah, there's surrogate gradient derivative, and we can now choose how big the support of that is. We always normalize it to one, but we can now choose how, how broad it is. And I call that parameter g. That's the kind of slope of the surrogate gradient function. And based on that, we can now also calculate Lyapunov exponents. So basically, we now not calculate Lyapunov exponents of the forward dynamics, but instead we use the surrogate gradient uh, function, and then we can define a surrogate Lyapunov spectrum. And you can see that if your uh, gradients are very shallow, so basically, uh, then you are uh, like close to the identity, then you have, in this case, many positive Lyapunov exponents. If you make your gradient um, very sharp, so basically it, it's almost a step-like function, then most Lyapunov exponents, uh, zero-get Lyapunov exponents here are at the inverse uh, characteristic 
time scale of the so basically the membrane potential and the synaptic time scale. So these are just the diagonal elements of the Jacobian, and so that gives us some some ideas of what this um, parameter of the sharpness of the zero get uh, gradient is, is doing. Now and we Sorry, can do it. Tell yeah. you that you're out of time. So if you can wrap up quickly, that would be Whoa. great. Whoa. Okay. Great. So we can do the same uh, zero get gradient flossing and spike networks. And just in a simple XOR task, uh, you can see that um, we, you get two spike patterns. You compare whether they're the same or different over many time steps. You can see that the training is being improved. So con to conclude, we use a link, or we found a link between vanishing exploding gradients when training recurrent networks with backdrop through time and Lyapunov exponents. And now gradient flossing is the idea of tuning these Lyapunov exponents in order to bridge longer time scales, and you can do exactly the same on zero get gradient. Uh, and this way, you can improve training on both binary and spike networks. If you want to learn more about Lyapunov exponents, you can check out the first paper, uh, or this gradient flossing idea is in a paper from last year. I uh, also have a way of, of um, simulating very large event-based spike networks, if that's of interest for you. And um, we are still working on this uh, zero get gradient flossing idea. And I'd be really curious to get your ideas. Here are a couple of outlooks, but I guess I could just say thank you for uh, my lab, um, for my um, postdoc mentor, Larry Abbott. Actually, he suggested this idea of zero get uh, gradient flossing. And thank you all for your attention. And I'm really curious to hear about your ideas. Uh, the thank stage you so is open much. for a question. Yeah, thank you very much. It was actually super interesting. RNMs are back. Uh, so we have a lot of questions. Um, I'm going to start with the first one from Matteo um, mm -hmm. that got uh, 12 votes. So thank you for your cool results. How does the computation of the Lyapunov exponent scale with the network size and number of time steps? Yeah, um, great question. So um, the the um, computational bottleneck is the QRT composition and the scales with the number of neurons times the Lyapunov exponent squared. So in the case where you'd have a fixed number of Lyapunov exponents, it just would be a linear term. But in case you um, floss all Lyapunov exponents, it's cubic. What I found is that very often, at least for spiking networks, it's enough to push one or two zero get Lyapunov exponents towards zero. However, in, in these results on, on rate networks, when you have to bridge many time steps and keep many items in memory. It seems you want to have more Lyapunov exponents close to zero. And um, I think it's a very important question regarding the scalability. There are also tricks to kind of use a proxy for it. And one advantage is you don't need to do the QR decomposition every single time step, but every few time steps. So that might also rescue you. And just to give you an intuitive idea for these networks that I trained on the order of hundreds of neurons, usually the uh, gradient flossing took like pre-flossing took something like 30 seconds, but then the training takes something like half an hour. So their gradient flossing is not really expensive. But if you floss all the Apunov exponents for a very big network, at some point they would become expensive. Okay. I hope that answers your question. Great. Um, the next question is by Friedemann. Um, how does flossing relate to natural gradients? Um, Honestly, I don't know. Um, so maybe I can talk a little bit more about the mechanisms of what's going on. Um, when you do flossing, it depends. I mean, you can do flossing also on biophysical parameters. For example, you could whatever change the density of sodium channels in your Hodgkin-Huxley model using flossing if you manage to propagate these gradients far enough. Um, what, what I find is that there's both a collective reorganization of the eigenvalues. If you look at the eigenvalues of your connectivity, they develop kind of a, a semi-ring structure after gradient flossing in spike networks and a ring structure in, in RNNs, discrete time RNNs, which I still want to understand better. And But then there, if I also floss the single neuron parameters, for example, the membrane, uh, the, the synaptic time scale, I will find, and that's maybe trivial, I'll just find that there are very slow single neuron parameters after gradient flossing, which of course help you bridge long time scales. Um, I think there is a third, oh yeah, there's a third parameter, which is of course this gradient slope. So if you also change or like floss this, the slope parameter of your zero get gradients, they tend to be more shallow with gradient flossing. But of course, what you 
you want to avoid exploding gradients, so you can't make them super shallow. Also, that wouldn't make it, uh, then it's not possible to train nonlinear tasks anymore. So I think, um, yeah, in, in my last iteration of this work, I found a way of doing it basically adaptively, meaning that you, um, you during training, you, you measure your Lyapunov exponents or a proxy of it, and then depending on how big or small it is, you can push it towards zero. So if the gradients are small, it's a way of making gradients great again. Okay, cool. The next question is by Alessandro Galloni. Um, asking, is there any relation between optimizing the Lyapunov exponent and EI balance? Um, there is not an obvious link. So balanced networks can be chaotic, but they also can be stable. And um, then I should say this balance relates more to um, that you have net inhibitory currents that are dynamically canceled. Uh, sorry, that dynamically cancel a positive external input current, and that doesn't. That's kind of like the the global stability of your, let's say, global fixed point of the dynamics, but it's not related directly to the microscopic stability of like how infinitesimal perturbations would evolve. There might be some link that I'm not aware of, and I'd be happy to chat more with you about that. Okay, great. I'll just take the uh, the last one, the mm -hmm. last question. But well, there are more questions, and you can look and maybe contact them. But there's a question awesome. by, by our next speaker, actually, in the next session, the invited speaker, okay. Anne Levina. And ah, she's, yes. Yeah, so she's asking reservoirs uh, often prefer to be a bit below one because exactly one might be um, remembering the, the noise for too long or exploding with mm -hmm. the input. Um, so do you experience any problems being too close to one? Yeah, that's a great question. And Anna Levina is actually one of the experts on self-organized criticality. And I think there is a link here between gradient flossing and self-organized criticality. Um, um, in a nutshell, indeed, gradient flossing can harm your task performance. If you have, for example, a nonlinear task that requires your Lyapunov exponents to be negative, let's say you want to train a network on a fixed point, you don't want your Lyapunov exponents close to zero. So what I understand is there can be a trade-off between having a very expressive network and having a very trainable network. And by pushing Lyapunov exponents to zero, you make them trainable, but possibly not as expressive. Um, the the um, pragmatic solution that I have for that is I usually do gradient flossing in the beginning or for the first few uh, hundred um, training steps, and then I, I leave leave the Lyapunov exponents by themselves and just train on the task. And this this way I achieved good performance. I'm happy to, to discuss this more. Um, yeah, I agree that probably you don't want your Lyapunov exponents to be positive because then your network would blow up and maybe, the, maybe relating to your question, maybe there would be a safety margin. Um, so far, I never saw an advantage of like training the network to have Lyapunov exponents slightly smaller than one, but that would also be worth investigating in more detail. Thanks for that great question. Great. Thank you so much to our invited speaker and contributed speakers. This was great. Um, I think we can close the session now. Um, we are eight minutes uh, late on schedule. Uh, I don't know, Friedemann uh, or Dan, how do you want to do the break? Do, you, do we want to come back at uh, 4 or 4.10? <laughs> Yeah, thanks so much for the, uh, to the speakers. Yeah, we come uh, we come back on time, so we stick to our strict schedules. We'll be back at four, and uh, uh, at least in some time zones, so to the full hour, we'll be back online. Thanks, Monica, right. for sharing. That was great. Thanks. Yeah, thank you again.